This is Mountaintop History, a podcast from the Thomas Jefferson Foundation at Historic Monticello. I'm Chad Wollerton, in for Kyle Chattleton. Jefferson once famously wrote to John Adams, I cannot live without books. What is less known is that for at least part of his life, Jefferson could not easily read without the aid of corrective lenses. This week, we're rebroadcasting an early episode of our podcasts featuring Catherine Stubbins McCaffrey, a scholar researching Jefferson's interest in eyeglasses as part of a larger look at the history of spectacles and how their design and use changed in the 18th and 19th centuries. Journalist Sean Tubbs reports. Jefferson lived during a time when the science of optics and the craft of spectacle making were laying the foundation for dramatic changes in design and technology of eyeglasses. As literacy spread throughout Europe and North America, so did the need to help older eyes make out letters on the page, especially in dimly lit homes. The colonists in North America in the years before Thomas Jefferson's birth didn't have much need for eyeglasses. For one thing, they just did not live in a world where you had as many demands placed on vision. That's Catherine Stebbins McCaffrey, a graduate student in New England and American Studies at Boston University. McCaffrey spent the summer of 2005 as a fellow at Monticello's Robert H. Smith International Center for Jefferson Studies, researching how the sage of Monticello used spectacles in his life. She's working on a study of how eyeglasses evolved to meet the needs of an increasingly literate population. The need for assisted vision grew as the Enlightenment began to change the Western world. There you have this clear world of not just reading, um, but also the growing importance of writing as part of being a literate person. I mean, people who were literate in the past weren't necessarily able to even sign their own names, even if they could read. Um, Now, reading and writing are going more and more hand in hand as skills to learn together. And uh, writing in particular, it taxes the eyes. People talk about how They apologize for having poor writing or leaving a lot of ink blots on letters uh, because they don't have a good pair of spectacles or because they lost their pair of spectacles. McCaffrey says scholars believe glasses were invented in Italy at the end of the 13th century by artisans who wanted something to help them perform detailed work. But with the development of the printing press, many found it hard to make out the tiny letters on the page. McCaffrey says advances in printing technology helped many more people learn to read, spreading knowledge. Enlightenment can happen because of spectacles or, or scientific inquiry is linked to uh, the development of spectacles because spectacles are the humble version of these much more complicated machines for seeing uh, that are developed out of them. The complicated spectacles of 300 years ago, around the time Ben Franklin was born, would look foreign to the contemporary eye. McCaffrey describes what you'd get in a London spectacle emporium circa 1725. First of all, there would be no arms on the side. Uh, They're known as temple pieces. There would be nothing to hold the eyeglasses to your head unless you held them there with your hand or unless you somehow devised to tie ribbons around them or put straps on them. They might be made of uh, horn or they could be made of various types of metals, say, uh, you know, copper, uh, or they could be made of leather. But the most durable would be to have a pair of leather frames. Those were usually thicker, had a thicker bridge um, between the two pieces of glass. Uh, They, you know, obviously could bend and not snap in two. As eyeglasses became more popular, spectacle makers began to experiment with adding short side pieces to help the wearer balance the lens. At first, they're very, very short pieces on the side, uh, and they still have huge round open finials, which are end pieces. They don't go behind the ears. Um, they're often called, those early ones are often called wig spectacles because they're, you know, still maybe tied to a wig, which, you know, many of the uh, upper classes wore. As the culture of the 13 colonies grew, so did the need for spectacles. Philadelphia became known for such spectacle makers as John McAllister, but it was a famous founding father who helped make spectacles fashionable. Benjamin Franklin's such a prominent uh, example of someone who embraced wearing spectacles uh, 
all the time uh, because he could with temple pieces. Franklin sees spectacles as a real means to an end in a social environment. He wants to be able to sit at dinner tables in important meetings with people and be able to see what he's eating in front of him and pay attention to the people who are across the table from him and down the table. And he also goes so far as to say that he really feels like unless he can clearly see people who are speaking to him in a foreign language, he has trouble understanding what they're saying. To assist with his needs, Franklin invented bifocals as a way to avoid carrying two pairs of glasses. But Jefferson was like most of his contemporaries and wore spectacles reluctantly. For Jefferson, I just don't think that he relished brandishing the spectacles in public. Um, People probably knew that he had them, but it was not a tool that he wanted to, uh, 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 you know, flourish uh, and deploy in the same way for Franklin. Jefferson wore eyeglasses to help with a mild case of myopia. Some of his glasses are on display at Monticello, the frames crafted from silver. Jefferson would pay up to $15 a pair, about $100 in today's money. McCaffrey says he would wear spectacles while reading, but also while touring his estate. He could definitely find it very convenient to use bifocals as he is out taking notes in his ivory notebook, um, you know, surveying the grounds uh, of his plantations, etc. Jefferson is known as one of the country's greatest natural scientists, but McCaffrey says he wasn't interested in studying the nature of vision until after he left the White House in 1809. Until then, he relied on Philadelphia's John McAllister for the best bifocals he could find. Upon retirement, he collaborated with McAllister to help improve the technology. In her research at Monticello, McCaffrey has been reading correspondence regarding a unique pair of glasses of Jefferson's. Which, as Gay Wilson actually points out, work like trifocals because they're so small. You can peer over the top of them altogether. So you really have three different options for uh, looking at different places, focusing on different uh, sites. Another exhibit on display at Monticello is a pair of what look to the modern eye as sunglasses. McCaffrey says these glasses weren't quite like Ray-Bans. They are not really sunglasses in the way we think of that, sunglasses as controlling UV rays or uh, interfering with UV rays. I mean, one aspect of green glass spectacles, which were around uh, in the 18th century, in the 19th century, and very popular, um, is that glass, uh, uh, sand, glass is made from sand, (laughs) um, and sand has this kind of brown sandy tint, right, which is iron oxide. And when you fire it to make glass, um, you can often produce a green tint. So, you know, early glass often has this obvious green tint to it. And to some extent, green glass spectacles, you know, grow out of uh, maximizing the green. Um, you know, at the same time, people are trying to get make glasses achromatic, you know, clear, fully clear. Other people are uh, maximizing the green tint. The focus is on light, but it's not necessarily sunlight. They're much more interested in the fact that just light is bouncing around off of objects, particularly white objects, and that there's a lot of glare, and uh, that in order to control that light, to produce a pleasant sensation when you are looking at things... While these glasses seem relatively transparent to us when compared with today's sunglasses, in Jefferson's day, they seem to have masked the wearer's identity effectively. Former slaves Ellen Craft and Lewis Clark both claimed to have used green spectacles to help them escape slavery. McCaffrey says by the end of the 18th century, about four out of five white males could read. Newspapers flourished, pamphlets helped spread revolutionary fervor, and literacy became even more important in the 19th century as the Industrial Revolution began to come to life. But for her work, her time at the International Center for Thomas Jefferson Studies changed the way she was approaching her dissertation, because unlike Franklin, Jefferson did not often write about his eyewear. I was lapsing into seeing what people said about their spectacles. But what do you do when someone doesn't talk extensively about why they have them? Well, you start to look at their actual practices, how they, you know, what they do with them, who they give them to, you know, uh, how you suspect that they're actually wearing them, um, when they're deciding to, you know, use them. If you can figure out how much they decide to pay for them, even, it might be an indicator of their value or their status. 
McCaffrey says she's exploring several other avenues, such as noting where and when Jefferson lost his spectacles, or considering why and how Jefferson gave spectacles as gifts to both the free and enslaved. She's even found herself imagining how Jefferson might have used his copy of the famous optician George Adams' book on eye care to fit himself with glasses. I could just picture Jefferson standing in front of a mirror, trying to figure out and measure with some kind of ruler the distance between his own pupils. I mean, to me, that just seems like a maddening practice to have to go through in order to accurately describe for yourself. I mean, that's just an amazing sort of physical moment of scrutiny, (laughs) self-scrutiny, trying to measure your own body in that way and think about your body's relationship to other things around it, including a book. Do you hold it 14 inches away? Do you hold it nine inches away? I mean, it's, it's just suddenly the whole world is transformed into one that requires a lot of numbers and diagrams. <laughs> Which no doubt would have appealed to Thomas Jefferson. This has been another edition of Mountaintop History, a collaboration between WTJU and the Thomas Jefferson Foundation. To learn more and to plan your next visit, go to our website at monticello.org.